All right, so welcome uh, everybody to this uh, theory seminar from um, uh, Laboratoire de Physique in Lyon. So today we have uh, Laura Donnet. So Laura was a PhD student in Brussels with uh, Glenn Barnich. And then she did the first postdoc uh, at Harvard. And now she's a postdoc in Vienna. And she will tell us about uh, celestial holography. Thank you. So let me start by uh, thanking Marc and Etera for the nice invitation to speak here. So I understood that it was a diverse audience, so I wanted to, to make a sort of a review talk on this program, which is called Celestial Holography. Um, so the basic idea of this program is to develop a framework which aims at formulating a holographic description of quantum gravity in asymptotically flat space-times. Um, so as you will see the level, I will try to keep an introductory level and review the building blocks that have paved the way to this proposal. So for some of you, it would be uh, pretty uh, boring. And for some of you, I hope that um, I can introduce the elements that are um, important for this recent uh, program. So please, um, I, I'm not expecting to talk like one hour without interruption. So please in, just ask any question if you, whenever you want and interrupt me for if you need some clarification or even if you have comments, I mean, I'm happy to, to discuss anything with you. <clears throat> okay. So, so the holographic principle is, roughly speaking, uh, telling us that a theory of quantum gravity is encoded in a different theory that lives in a lower dimensional space-time. So of course, uh, we would like to know how general is this uh, principle? Is it a fundamental principle of nature? And if so, then we should understand it beyond the canonical cases. In particular, um, the groundbreaking realization of this principle is the so-called ADS-CFT correspondence, uh, which is a very nice story that has been unfolded over the last decades, which has uh, revealed a kind of refined structure about quantum gravity in anti serial space-time, which have a negative cosmological constant. So the DSCFT correspondence establishing that quantum uh, gravity in, in, uh, in anti space spacetime can be equivalently encoded as a, quant as a conformal field theory that lives at the boundary of the spacetime. So conformal field theory is a quantum field theory which is uh, invariant under conformal transformation. And here as an example of a conformal transformation, it's a transformation that uh, roughly is preserving the angles. So the focus of my talk will be to understand what a, what, how this story can carry along or even be generalized to a flat space-time, space-times which have a vanishing cosmological constant. So why do we care about flat space-time? Well, of course, we live in a decider space-time with a positive um, cosmological constant. But flat space is a very good approximation for most purposes in, in physics. So that's a very important uh, framework to understand. In particular, uh, we would like to answer the question, uh, is there a dual uh, conformal field theory at the boundary? And which boundary is that? And if so, what are its properties? Can we come with a consistent set of properties for this theory? And OK, how, how does this even work in, in flat space times? Another motivation I have for, for this program is to understand black hole physics. So as we know, black holes have a huge amount of entropy given by the Bekenstein, Hawking, uh, and Ariello. And I think it's fair to say that so far we do not understand where this entropy basically is coming from or what, what are the microstates that are counting responsible for this huge amount of states for black holes. There have been uh, important advances in this direction uh, in, by considering black holes in a specific theory, such as uh, superstimetric black hole instinct theory, or uh, black hole which are uh, assumed to be extremely spinning, 
or in, in other kind of frameworks, um, like for instance, in ADS3, black holes and so on and so forth. But I, I think it's fair to say that in all the examples, the success of these uh, results basically relied not on the, on the, on the really on the stringy details of the theory or, or on the number of dimensions, but, but rather on the fact that in, in all these cases, there was an ADS factor in the near horizon region of black holes that made the, the computation to work very nicely. So in other words, I would say that most of what we know about quantum probability of black hole is closely tied with the advances of the DSCFT correspondence. And as such, the Bekenstein, Hawking, and uh, Aria law is one of the primordial uh, holographic relationship because it's telling us that the entropy of the black hole scales not the, with the volume, but rather with the area of the event horizon, namely with the boundary of the volume. Of course, uh, realistic black holes, like this black hole that we see in the sky in the center of galaxies, do not possess an ADS, an anti-dissiter uh, region in their near horizon region. Uh, for instance, the Kerr black hole. And if we want to understand these objects, maybe we would uh, need to develop a holographic correspondence for asymptotically flat space times. And as the aim of this talk is to present the recent advances in this program called celestial holography. And as you will see, this is based on a very, a bunch of very uh, important results that actually go beyond uh, holography. If you do not care about holography, uh, maybe you would be interested in any way in some aspects of this, uh, of this uh, proposal because as you will see, it has connected um, a bunch of different frameworks and uh, theories and even uh, communities uh, between each other. So I will review uh, that in the first part of the talk. So as you will see, the whole of my talk will be centered about the theme of symmetries in gravity. And of course, we know that symmetries are uh, of tremendous importance in understanding um, basically any, any physical process. So um, that would be uh, my, uh, the, the way that I will uh, attack the problem. So the talk uh, will, uh, will, will go as follows. So first I will review um, the so-called infinite dimensional symmetry that appear at the boundary of flat space time, which are the so-called BMS symmetries that most of you uh, know very well here, um, but they are probably not uh, standard for everyone. And then I will try to present um, this celestial holography problem, program. And if I have some time and if I can digress on the on black hole, I will also mention a couple of things about them. So, okay, let, let me start very slowly by just, um, Starting with the flat, um, a flat space time in, in four dimensions, namely the Minkowski metric, which is described by this element. And in my talk, I will use this very convenient set of coordinates called uh, the Bondi coordinates. So the Bondi coordinates involve a new time coordinate, which is now called U. It's kind of a retarded time coordinates. And these uh, radial coordinate R and these Z and Z bar variables, which are uh, stereographic coordinates for the two sphere. So they are related by the usual theta phi angles in this way. And this is the, the line element for the unique round sphere becomes given by, it's now given by this expression using these probably not very familiar uh, coordinates. So a very important picture that will appear a lot in my talk is the Penrose diagram from Minkowski. So the Penrose diagram is something uh, very convenient, which is um, roughly speaking construction that brings uh, uh, the boundary, the infinity of a space time to a finite distance so that I can draw it in, the, in, in this uh, presentation. 
but it's keeping the causal structure of the space-time preserved. Uh, in particular, um, the light rays um, of Mars's particles in the Penrose diagram always propagates along a line of 45 degrees. And light rays um, all end their life in this boundary, which is called future null infinity or SPRI plus, which is the, the hypersurface that you get when you take the radial coordinate being very large, keeping the other coordinates constant. So each point in this uh, diagram is supposed to be a two sphere. Here, uh, the best I can do is draw a circle. Um, but you have really to think that each point in this diagram is a, is a two sphere. And Z and Z bar are the labels, the coordinates that are uh, living on the sphere. The sphere that is at future null infinity is called the celestial sphere. So future null infinity is a null hypersurface. Um, this uh, U, this retarded uh, null uh, time is running along these coordinates. And topologically, null infinity is the, so it's this line times the two sphere, which is called the celestial sphere. So this celestial sphere will be very important in, their, in, in the celestial holography program. So please keep that in mind. Uh, there is an analogous boundary, which is at the past, which is called the past null infinity, which is the place where all the incoming massless particles uh, come from. And just to, to mention, I mean, a massive particle instead will, will do something like that in this diagram, start from a past time like infinity and will uh, end its life here. But in this talk, I will be mostly uh, interested into massless particles. So to repeat, that come from scry minus and exit the space time at scry plus. So now, uh, I want to discuss uh, something a bit more uh, generic, which is called an asymptotically flat spacetime. So the definition for this spacetime is, uh, is a curved spacetime that looks flat, so that looks just like Minkowski, seen from very far away. So a metric for this spacetime is given in for first approximation by the, this line element here, plus some corrections or boundary conditions for the metric field, which takes this following form. So let me explain what, what, it, what it is. So I have written it here. So this is the metric for asymptotically flat spacetime in the sense of Bondi, Messner, and Zacks that were studied in the 60s. So the important thing about this metric is, is that it involves, uh, well, so as you see, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an expansion is in large R, uh, plus uh, sub-bleeding correction that goes with the one over r to a higher power that I'm not writing down. And it involves a couple of functions here in blue. So the functions in blue are arbitrary functions of all coordinates except from r. Um, the mb here is called the Bondi mass aspect. It's an arbitrary function of u, z, and z bar that roughly speaking is capturing the amount of energy in the space-time that you are describing. So for instance, if you take a, a, a curl black hole, if you take the curl metric, you write it in this coordinate, and you will see that in this case, the MB will just be a constant, it will just be the, the mass of the curl black hole. <clears throat> the NZ similarly uh, give you the angular momentum. And importantly, this function C here, so it's, uh, it has uh, ZZ uh, components, but there is also a CZ bar, Z bar component. It, it indicates the presence of gravitational radiation that is leaking out through scribe class. So more precisely, if the time derivative of this function here, this is sometimes called the new tensor, this time derivative here. If the new tensor is non-zero, it means that you, you are capturing a space-time that is emitting gravitational wave which are ex escaping your boundary um, uh, and leaving space-time at future null infinity. So for instance, if you have a black hole merger, it will emit gravitational radiation and you will see your detector will be able to see uh, this. 
So in other words, this is nothing but a mathematical description of a space-time that is emitting gravitational radiation. So is, is there any question at this stage or? <clears throat> if not, um, let me go on. So now what, what these people were uh, wondering is they wanted to understand what is the symmetric group of this kind of space-times. So what you might expect is the isometric group of Minkowski space-time, namely the Poincaré group. The Poincaré group, the Poincaré group is, consists of four uh, translations, three space rotations, and three boosts. But surprisingly, what was found is actually an infinite dimensional extension of Poincaré, which is now called the BMS group. So how does this infinite extension appear? Well, so you, if you want to look at, when you try to look at so-called asymptotic symmetries, what you are uh, looking for is a set of vector fields that preserve the set, this set of metric. So the game that you play has two rules. So basically the first rule is that you are, uh, what you're, you're allowed to actually change this function here in blue. So when you act on this metric with this vector field via the lead derivative, you are allowed to change this function here, but you are not allowed to change the powers in R in this expansion. And if you do that, you find that uh, such a vector field takes this form. Uh, so the important thing about uh, this vector field is that it involves, as you see here, an arbitrary function f of the angle. So f here is an ar any arbitrary function, I'll call it f, but it's just a, something that depends in an arbitrary way of z and z bar. And this was called a super translation vector field. Why? Because unlike a usual time translation that would just shift you by a constant, this f, uh, this super translation now are shifting the time in an arbitrary uh, uh, amount depending on which point on the sphere you're at. Um, so that's, that's why you have, uh, actually the symmetries are much bigger than the usual uh, Poincaré transformations and they were called this, this vector field which called super translation. So it has nothing to do with super symmetry, it's just the statement that um, you, you have many more ways of, of shifting your coordinates uh, than by a constant, you can do it in an infinite amount of different ways. So the conclusion of this part of the, of the talk is that the symmetry group of asymptotically flat space time is much bigger than the one of Minkowski. It's actually an infinite dimensional extension of Poincaré that is called the BMS group, standing for Bondi, Messner, and Zacks. So what these people have found is a kind of the, I don't know if the first, maybe the first example of a symmetry enhancement phenomenon um, in gravity where the, um, the four usual, uh, the four point correct transformation are um, enhanced to this infinite amount of super translations. So originally uh, this symmetry were disregarded actually um, more than that, these guys were, were very upset because th their goal was to recover the Poincaré group. And what they found instead is this infinite amount of super sim of, of symmetries and they, they try to kill them by hand. They said, okay, we don't want this tower of infinite symmetry. What, what is this? I mean, we, what we want is the Poincaré group. So let's impose for, uh, stronger boundary conditions to kill these symmetries. But when you do so, you realize that what you are doing is you are killing all the gravitational radiation of the system. So you can do it, but then you will describe a space time that cannot emit uh, radiation. And that was a problem for that because for them, because this was their actual uh, motivation at that time, the status of gravitational wave in GR was not clear. So they wanted to make uh, a solid work uh, on that. And, and okay, they found this symmetry and no one really knew uh, what to do with them or why, why, what they meant. Excuse me? Yes. Sorry. Could you go back to the previous slides? 
So this the this metric, of course, I could have written just uh, Minkowski in the standard uh, coordinates. And but this, so maybe I missed it, but uh, how is this um, corrections, the form of the corrections motivated? Or is it, so if I were to write this in standard uh, coordinates, just X, Y, Z, how would I see this? All right, so here, uh -huh. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. So um, here, basically why I'm working in coordinate is because you see that I am, well, okay, there is actually a, a, a sort of a subtle story why you need, for, so first, if you want to describe gravitational radiation, you're describing a thing that propagates ar along a null, a null direction. Right, so it's very convenient to introduce this null time because then you know that u constant and r large, you will basically fall, you will like sit on the photon and then follow, follow the null array and land here. Mm -hmm. So that, that justifies the, the choice of these coordinates. Now, there are actually uh, more reasons to look at these coordinates. It's actually the fact that you can do a parse in R expansion without, with no logarithm in R in this expansion. And that's, uh, that was the main motivation. To, that's actually an important motivation to study. It's actually very, very convenient to work in these coordinates. But now, of course, I mean, um, in, in general, you could, um, it doesn't require uh, a specific, you can do an analysis without any specific choice of, of coordinates, but it's just uh, very convenient to use these ones for looking at this specific prob problem. So is this, um, are these corrections unique? Is the form uh, unique or could I, have got, could I have gotten different terms, extra terms, for example? Right, so uh, that's always a tricky thing about boundary conditions because so typically the game that you want to play is you want to um, allow, so you want to be general enough to encode interesting solutions, like for instance here the gravitational radiation, but you don't want to be too relaxed neither because uh, you might have some, you know, some infinities coming at some point, some uh, divergences coming, but actually small, small note aside, you can also actually uh, treat this divergence if they appear but but basically yeah you you you, you want to find a balance between uh keep keep enough keep, keep enough freedom to include interesting solutions but also uh, keep the system under control and not have crazy thing going on so this is a tricky business so yeah yeah it's not clear that this is the right exactly what you have to look at from from the very beginning Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Is there another question? Okay. So yeah, so we have these BMS symmetries and I want to just show you that why people have been uh, re, I mean, interested again into these symmetries and how they actually are very crucial in this program of celestial holography. So one of the um, important aspects of these symmetries is that they are related to a priori totally different stuff, which is the soft theorems in quantum field theory. So now I'm just talk talking about a totally different thing, uh, but as you will see, this is, this is actually related. So, um, so the leading soft graviton theorem of Weinberg in the 60s, a statement about scattering amplitudes. So more precisely, if you have an amplitude, a scattering amplitude involving n particle plus an extra particle, which is called a soft particle. So you have n here, n is equal to four, and you add an extra one, which is taken to be soft, namely its energy, omega here denotes the energy of, the, of this particle in red, goes to zero. If you have such an, uh, such an amplitude, it will factorize. Um, so roughly speaking, it will be equal to the, to the amplitude without the soft particle times a factor, which is called the soft factor. So this is a form of the soft factor. It involves the momenta of the, of the, 
of the hard as opposed to soft uh, particles and the momentum of the soft particle. So what was found is that this soft theorem that was known from, from the 60s can actually be understood coming from a symmetry uh, principle. And the symmetry that is responsible for this theorem is the support translation symmetry that I, I have just presented. So the mathematical rigorous relationship is the fact that the uh, wired identity that, that is associated to this uh, symmetry is nothing but the soft theorems. So here the wired identity involves a charge. So this is the, the another charge that is associated to the super translation parameter F. Here is the bounding mass aspect and this is the super translation charge. And the plus means that actually you have the you have a charge defined at future infinity and the one at past null infinity. There are actually an in, in IT pod identification between the two, but I, I don't want to enter into much details. What I want to just show is that we have soft theorem in quantum field theory. It actually can be understood coming from a symmetry principle and the, res, the symmetry responsible is the support translation symmetry. And there is, you can prove this equality. It involves a, a bunch of steps, but you can see this explicitly. It's not a mere analogy, it's really a, a, a precise uh, st a mathematical statement. And this have actu has actually, uh, is actually a part of the so-called infrared triangle that was mostly developed by Andy Strominger and collaborators. So this triangle establishes a, a set of relationships between three topics in physics, the first one, is asymptotic symmetry. This is the thing that I started to talk about in general relativity. The second is the one of soft theorems in quantum field theory. And the third one is memory, uh, is, is the so, are the so-called memory effects. So memory effects uh, were known by GR people, uh, but not the same one as this one, uh, starting from the 70s and further further uh, developed in the 90s. So the memory effect, what, what is this? Is, um, so we, we often hear that gravitational waves squeeze and stretch, stretch uh, space-time. But what do, we do not often uh, hear is that um, long after the wave has passed, there will be a residual squeeze and stretch of the space-time. So in other words, the memory effect is a permanent displacement of, of uh, the detector, the position of the detectors after the passage of the gravitational wave. So for, for instance, here is the, um, the merger of uh, two black holes. So you can see the signal that would be um, the signal in red uh, is the signal with memory and the signal in blue is if you do not, if you would not have memory. So the memory effect has not been measured yet, but it's expected that it's measured very soon at LIGO or, or LISA. So the memory effect was found actually to be the physical and if you want observational manifestation of BMS uh, symmetries. In other words, two space time that differ by a BMS super translation, uh, you can actually uh, see that it's equivalent to uh, the displacement memory effect. So I'm just sketching here uh, the story, but uh, there is, um, so, so here to be, to, to be precise, I told you about support translation and how the wired identity was actually the subgraviton theorem. And um, you can actually see that this is sort, there is a sort of vacuum transition associated with, uh, uh, that's acting with support translation uh, changes the vacuum and then this vacuum transition, nothing but the memory effect. And you can go also, from these two corners and to close this, uh, this set of relationships. So this was um, very nice. So maybe let me uh, skip that. Uh, I, I just want to show that here that there are many copies of this triangle. What I mean by copy is that I talked about, uh, it, it, that it's not restricted to a specific theory in a specific uh, number dimension or or, or, or something like that. That is actually there is a very rich analogous set of relationship for uh, 
gauge theories, abelian, non-abelian. There is also um, uh, the story also carries on for higher than four dimensions, and and so on and so forth. So I, I'm not, of course, explaining what I all, I all this triangle, and I don't want to say that in each case all the uh, all the corners and relationship has been have been established. But it's it's, an, it's pretty um, it's expected that this feature is a universal feature of and of the infrared structure of, of gravity, but also of gauge theories. So is there any question before I, I move to the core of the talk, which is cell-cell holography, but now we have most of the ingredients to... Sorry, can I ask another question? So maybe just if you know, how, how do they will measure this memory effect? What the, what are they expecting to see? Or, so it's really you know? an off yeah it's really this offset in the signal for instance. So, so, so far, uh -huh. yeah. yeah, so far they don't see it, but they haven't looked for it actually, oh, because okay. they, they they don't really care. You see, they don't really care about the the zero basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What you really need to 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 be careful is you need to compare the signal at very late times compared to the in initial position of the, you need the initial, you need to know the initial position of the detector before and after the wave has passed and then comparing then to see that there is a shift. But it's a very subtle effect. Um, and so it has not been uh, looked at mm -hmm. uh, seriously, but, but honestly, I think it's just a matter of time before they measure it. Maybe I'd like go, but maybe most likely Eliza. They they have been paper just just uh, uh, establishing how you can how you can measure it. But so it's pretty so it, well under control. Yeah. So it is measurable. I mean it's not yeah, yeah. the effect that no 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 they are no 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 it's yeah it's just a matter of you know caring. You you need to convince the PDX experiment at least at some point that they should look for that. And I think now people are are into that but uh, yeah. Yeah, it okay. is measurable. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good. So, cell cell holography. Okay, so we have this uh, this story for ADS, and we want to understand what happens for flat space time. Uh, so first thing to notice is that the causal structure of the boundary of flat space is very different from ADS. In ADS, you have this time-like boundary. Now in, um, in flat space or simply flat space, you have this null hypersurface, right? So null inf uh, infinity is a null, it's a null surface. Um, so just to recall, it's, it includes uh, the celestial sphere here labeled by Z and Z bar. Oh, sorry, there is an issue with the here with the the formula. Okay, what what I meant to say here is that a very naive and important thing to look at is how so in 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 bulk we have the 4D Lorentz group, and just just a very simple observation is that this Lorentz group acts on the celestial sphere on this coordinate z and z bar as the as an SL2C transformations. So this is just a set to C transformation of the angle. You have an analogous thing for Z bar. Um, and this is actually why uh, I want to use these uh, coordinates because it's, they, they really are uh, appropriate when you, when you want to look at conformal transformations because they transform very nicely. So the, the, the less celestial holography proposal is claiming that you can um, that the 4D spacetime S matrix is encoded into a two-dimensional conformal field theory that lives on the celestial sphere. Well, or rather, a so-called celestial conformal field theory. So the name celestial is just there for two reasons. Actually, the first one is that the the this, the dual theory lives on this. Sphere, this celestial sphere, but also we put celestial in front of CFT because 
We don't know so far what is the theory. It's clearly not the usual conformal field theory. It has a bunch of very weird and, and funny features that I will briefly mention. But basically, the goal is to, uh, to see how this proposal, how, the, what, how, how far can this sentence push us? So can we take really this seriously and, and see how, how much we can know about this dual, uh, dual theory? So let me explain a little bit in more detail. So we have, let's say we have a scaring process in Minkowski space and for the Minkowski space, we have say two incoming massless particle that enters enter uh, the space-time coming from scry minus, interact and then exit as scry plus. So each particle, when they enter or exit space-time, they will pierce the celestial sphere at a given point, say Z1, Z bar one, and exit the space-time also at a outgoing uh, point. <clears throat> so the idea is that such a scattering process can be recast as a correlation function on a 2D celestial conformal field theory. So the, the, the correlator here involves uh, some operators. So each operator creates or annihilates an ingoing or incoming particles that enters or exits the space time at the points Z and Z bar. So let me go into a little more details to make things a little bit more clear. So um, usually we use uh, the so-called, the standard formulation for, for, par for a particle state, which is the energy momentum basis where we have plane waves and particles are labeled by um, a momentum P mu. Um, this is the energy omega and if it's, it's a spinning particle uh, for the helicity, L. Now in celestial holography, we actually want to recast this uh, basis into a new basis, which is called the conformal basis. And it's obtained by doing this operation on the, on the plane wave, which is, so this integral here is called a Mellin transform of a plane wave. So you are Mellin transforming the energy omega of the particle and as a result, the object that you will get will no longer be, um, so what you do is also you express the momentum as you replace the momentum by the energy in a point Z and Z bar. So if you have a particle of a momentum uh, P mu, it will enter the, the, the it will uh, pierce the celestial sphere at this point Z, given by that. So this object here is now labeled no longer by P mu, but uh, by Delta, a conformal dimension and a point on the celestial sphere. And the 4D helicity is identified with the 2D spin. So why we want to do that? Because it's because in the usual plane wave basis, the translation symmetry is manifest, but the conformal transformation is obscure. So remember, we want to understand holography. So we want to make some sort of conformal transformation manifest. And now we do have such a manifest uh, transformation. Indeed, um, indeed, if you if you make an SL2C transformation on this Mellin transform of the plane waves, which play the role of this operator on the celestial sphere, then you see that it transforms as a primary with weights with weights h and h bar, which are respectively, as usual in CFT, the sum and the difference of the conformal dimension and the spin. So that's the whole point, is that uh, we want to make as much as possible all conformal transformations uh, manifest. So now, as I told you, um, in the beginning, we have these very nice uh, important relations that are these soft theorems. So the soft theorem were involving a particle which has energy going to zero. But now you see, because I'm trading omega for delta, I no longer have a notion of uh, energically soft particle. 
So what, um, so what is the analog in this basis of a soft particle? And that's what we uh, proposed in this paper with Andrea Pullman and Andy Strominger. We proposed to uh, introduce this new notion of conformally soft particle, um, which will now be obtained by taking certain values of the conformal dim uh, dimension delta. So um, here um, I'm just I, I just want to give us the more technical uh, table, but I, I just want to give you a picture of what we we are able to do with that. So so basically, uh, sorry. So basically, um, I told you about. If you look at gravity, you have this super translation symmetry. And I told you that it has to do with this soft graviton theorem. Now in the celestial horography, what, what we were able to do is to construct a current, so an object that transforms as a current on the celestial sphere, uh, that, is that is encoding this, all this, uh, this story. So it's the so-called super translation current. And here I have written the weights of this object. So maybe the most simple uh, story is, is for uh, a gauge field AMU. So in this case, the symmetry that is associated is a large gauge uh, symmetry parametrized by this epsilon. And now this theorem is a soft photon theorem. And in this case, you can build a very uh, conventional object, which is the this so-called uh, U1 catch Moody current. So it's transformed as a one comma zero object on the celestial sphere. And um, more maybe an important aspect is that in gravity, you have another uh, set of, of symmetry, which are the so-called super rotations. Uh, I'm not entering too much details, but basically if the translation uh, enhance the usual uh, translation symmetry, the super rotation enhance the usual Lorentz symmetry to an infinite amount. They are now parametrized by an, arbi an arbitrary function uh, vector yz. And what you can show is that in this case, the current on the celestial sphere looks like a stress tensor in a, in a CFT. So, um, in all these cases, we were able to construct a current. And the idea is that um, by having this, this object on the sphere, we can, um, we can find OPE relationships um, that are constraining more and more the dual theory. And at some point, we'll have, already we have a lot of constraint to satisfy. We'll have a clear understanding of what is, uh, of what, what is celestial holography. So for instance, there is an even richer story because you have subleading theorems and even sub subleading theorems. Um, and in this case, this is actually a, a work in progress where we are uh, trying to understand what is the role of the current in this case. And uh, it's actually, there are actually some subtleties because there are no symmetry breaking that are responsible for existence of the theorem, but but okay, that's that's working programs. So okay, so maybe I can skip that. Um, so yeah, so in 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 summary, the um, celestial holography to me is a new paradigm that has a, a nice a bunch of nice uh, uh, things to offer. So first. Um, I would like to point out that if you, do, if you don't care about holography, uh, the fact to, to recast this amplitude in this, um, in this basis, in this celestial basis, uh, is actually interesting on its own right. So remember, I told you, you go from the, from the amplitudes to the correlator by doing this Madden transform. So he, if you have, um, a, an amplitude, the endpoint amplitudes, then you can rewrite it and recast it as a celestial correlators. And this exercise has been done explicitly by all these people. So uh, people have looked at, I don't know, three point image V gluon amplitudes. They have looked at uh, gravity um, and even string theory and loop corrections. 
And in all these cases, they were able to, to do that uh, explicitly and to see um, what we can learn uh, uh, from, from, from these objects. So broadly speaking, I mean, these celestial amplitudes are nice because they, they are giving you new, new ways of looking at scattering um, that are uncovering new hidden feature, mathematical features yeah, that you could not see by working with the plane waves. So they provide new organizing principle to, for the S matrix coming from, from symmetries. And they also have shown to give new insight into, into uh, some feature of scattering like these double copy relationships. So this, there, the, now there have been a, a lot of work on that. So it's actually difficult to keep track because there is so many, so many things uh, going on, but um, yeah. And the second point I would like to emphasize is that Celestial hierarchy it is, is actually going to some extent a bit further than ADS in the sense that uh, in ADS we have no radiation. No radiation is, is uh, allowed to escape, right? ADS is just act, acts like a box. But in celestial hierarchy, we do allow for outgoing radiation. <clears throat> and uh, celestial horography ha has um, somehow um, has way more, cons well, yeah, it has, it's, it's, way, it's way more intricate than it is in the sense that it is subject to an infinite amount of symmetry constraints that are coming on top of the usual uh, constraint coming from conformal invariance. And it gives right to some uh, funny feature, for instance, some of these constraints have no analog whatsoever in ADS-CFTs. Like this super translation symmetry that I talked about uh, is, is very weird from a CFT point of view because uh, this is an example of an OPE relation uh, that is implied by the presence of uh, super translation. And you can see that uh, OPE involving the super translation current is actually shifting the weights, uh, the dimension, sorry, of the operator by one unit. So it's something that you usually do not have in, uh, in usual uh, conformal field theory. This has to do with the fact that, um, well, basically we have this continuous, this, uh, this delta is a continuous uh, spectrum. So, so yeah, so, so far I, I cannot tell you what is um, exactly a celestial conformal field theory, or I cannot give you the full list, list of property that it has to satisfy, but the idea is that by building up all this uh, program, we will be um, we will uh, narrow down the search for for this and have a, a clear understanding of what celestial holography means, and and also in which way it differs uh, from, mm -hmm. from, from 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 the usual ADS story. And um, yeah, so basically that's the that's the that's the goal. So it's, it's still under program, it's, it's still a still recent, uh, a still recent um, adventure somehow. Is there a, any questions? So I was a bit sketchy, but uh, I'm trying to give a kind of a broad picture without uh, going into too much detail. So is it time, time for questions now, Laura? Or? Uh, uh, let's see, um, let me, no, let me, let, let, let me just, uh, I don't think I will have time to talk about black holes, but I, I just want to show that, okay, there is a very nice, uh, the symmetry I talked about also appear for black holes. I would, I, I would not have time to talk about that. Um, well, you but can. yeah, so okay. yeah, I can, I mean. It's interesting. No, I mean, I, I prefer to, yeah, okay, okay. I will do it quickly then, okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, so yeah, so far I've been looking at this region, Scribe Plus, but now if we have a black hole in the space time, uh, you have a horizon and, and what we did in this, in this work is that we looked at the near horizon expansion of this black hole. Um, so the horizon here is located at regular zero V is the time running along the horizon and we have the transverse coordinate. 
So it's like you're an observer and just hovering outside the horizon and you, you, can, you can see how this looks like. This looks like, uh, like this. Again, this function or arbitrary function uh, that do not depend on the radial coordinates. And what we found is that you have, again, some kind of super translation and super rotations, which are reminiscent from, from the one uh, coming from um, at null infinity. And, and crucially, they have actually, you can compute the charge associated to this and they are non-zero. So there is a whole, uh, let's say, uh, literature on how you can construct charge as associated to these uh, symmetries. But the important thing is that they are non-vanishing. So that means that black holes also exhibit a very rich amount of symmetries in the near horizon regions. And this is what people have called the soft hair for black holes. So we often hear black holes have no hair because uh, you know, black holes all look the same. They are uh, characterized uniquely by their mass and angular momentum. And this statement is true up to diffeomorphisms because, and in particular, um, these near horizon symmetries are uh, actually do not are diffeomorphism, but that change the physical state because they have another charge associated to, uh, with acting with this charge, you will, uh, you will change your state to another one. So this uh, super rotation and super translation charges were called uh, soft hair for the black hole. So this is something that was started um, by Hawking, Perry and Strominger in uh, 2016. What, 2015? Uh, and um, so now we understood that there was a small caveat into this, uh, this black hole no hair theorem. And it's still under um, debate if whether this soft hair would have something to do with the information paradox or uh, whether we could access the entropy uh, coming uh, from this uh, soft hair. So yeah, I mean, this is, I, I'm now I'm just giving you a kind of a broad vision of, of what, what I'm, I want to do in the future. So uh, as we have seen, this, both these regions, infinity and, and black holes have a very rich set of symmetries. And my goal is to, is to combi combine these two approach and regions and actually to go beyond these two uh, things separately. Um, so, so I think that we have uh, seen that there is a very nice story that is starting to emerge and, and uh, that's actually um, something that you guys here at Lyon have, have also been largely contributing to, is that the more we explore the subject, the more we see that we, we, we are aiming at some kind of organization principle for the symmetries in gravity. And one of the things I have learned is that, you know, we have always been imposing too strong boundary conditions and, and, and this point of view somehow have been limiting, um, has led to limitation. We, we missed some important stuff that we should have looked at from the very beginning. So I, so this is an example for those who know what I'm talking about. And I think, okay, so now we need to go beyond that approach, you know, you, beyond this kind of limited framework and, and this resonates very much to what uh, people have been doing here at, um, at, uh, at Lyon. So you, you guys have this very nice uh, analysis uh, in terms of corner symmetries and edge modes, which to some extent are, um, are, are giving the some, uh, some feature of a local holography and celestial holography would just, just be somehow an example of this uh, local holography when uh, the corner is pushed to infinity. So I think we have, well, I hope we can, we can somehow combine all these ideas together and uh, find new exciting physics. So thanks, thank you very much. Thanks, Laura. All right, we have time for a few questions. Can I ask something? Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, maybe it's very naive, but uh, you um, 
So when you look at, well, when these people look at the asymptotic, asymptotically flat spaces, kind of you, you explain, right? What sort of terms you expect to be the deviations from asymptotically flat, but how do you do it in the um, near horizon? So what is the leading terms and what's the next to leading terms? If you see right. I mean. So in this case, you, you can, you can get some hint by just taking your favorite black hole metric and then just make a near horizon expansion and then you will have a bunch of things that are familiar like you know the surface gravity and the um, and their the metric of the horizon and then just expand here near that now again all this business is it's I mean, then there have been many works that have been uh, somehow pushing this idea and generalizes our, our boundary condition like uh, that uh, Daniel Gumiller and other people in Vienna have been also uh, presenting a different uh, ways of, of, of looking at that uh, different, you know, different near horizon boundary conditions. So they, they have been, a, I would say now, a sort of zoology of boundary condition and algebra. So, uh, and it's not like, you know, one is necessarily better than the other. It's just, that's why I want, I think it's good to maybe at some point ordering the things and just try to come with what are the most general boundary conditions. Now, I mean, Daniel and others have understood this in 3D gravity, but uh, of course, this is a, a difficult question. But uh, yeah, so this is just to, to say that there is no unique way of doing that. And that's precisely one of the reasons why I, I think it would be good to, to uh, order all this. <coughs> Yeah, so to build up on this, maybe I wanted to ask, since you mentioned these extensions of the asymptotic symmetries that people have um, also discovered in uh, also in 3D and 4D, uh, is there any any idea of what this would correspond to on the um, either on the soft theorem side or on the memory effect side? Yes, yes. So. Um... Which symmetry you have in mind? Uh, which ones in particular? The super rotation story, or yes, or people have yeah. other extensions like um, DFS two or yeah, yeah. I, actually, yeah, it's a very interesting thing because um, well, you know that uh, there has been a sort of clash, or oh, not clash, but you know, different people have. Push put put forward different extension, right? Some there is the Vera Zero or the diff, full diffus two story. So my personal take on that is that nothing is is saying that you should restrict to the that you you should not take the full diffus two. Um, I, I don't think everyone would agree with this statement, but I think this is the right thing. I mean. Um, so, and from the soft theorem, so you can see that, um, so, okay, the guys who, who proposed that first was Comp were Compilia and Ladder, right? And, 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 um, in the soft theorem picture, you can see that the defects two are needed if you want a sort of one-to-one -one relationship with the sub, the subleading subgraviton theorem. So that was actually the original motivation to allow for that. And in the near horizon region, also like people like, actually our analysis didn't, we, we say, okay, we can look at the Vera Zero, but really nothing is telling you that you should restrict to that case. And I think in this membrane paradigm and all this Carol uh, approach and also work by Bob Pena and all these people, they have also emphasized this DFS2 point of view. And I think also, of course, uh, your work and uh, the one with uh, Laurent has, is pointing toward this direction. So, uh, but of course, if you have the full DFS2, then it's more complicated, right? Because, uh, you know, if you want to match as much as you can the usual CFT, then it's scary to have the full <laughs> DFS2 to some extent because you know, people know what to do very well with Vera Zoro, but so, but I think you should 
should be taken this seriously, so. No. Yeah, and I have another maybe very naive question, but I always I was always wondering about the, the role of time in these celestial CFTs, because it seems just dimensionally speaking, you know, it's in yeah it it's uh, it's in the de this delta guy that i i show you so it's so it's you see you go you have this u coordinates and then you go from the u to the energy by Fourier transform and then what i'm doing is that i'm integrating over all the 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 omega all the energy which was traded for you so you trade u for omega and omega for delta Mm -hmm. And so, in some sense, the that's why these translations are just so f so funny to some extent because now you have a continuum of this delta, and the translation are making you jump from delta to delta plus one. So that's 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 a funny feature, but it's you know it's 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 still encoded to some extent. Mm -hmm. But then from the, when we talk about this dual theory, do we really expect that it's actually a, a two plus one dimensional dual theory? Um, so in this, in this uh, holography, celestial holography proposal is really the idea that it's, it's living on the two spheres. So it's really a 2D, a 2D uh, Euclidean type of CFT. Um, but you could think of, I mean, you could maybe try to formulate holography in terms of a, so-called, uh, you know, two plus one sort of Carlian theory on scry. And I don't think that would be mutu necessarily mutually incompatible. It would just be a different way of, for, of repackaging the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but in, the, in this proposal, in this specific framework, it's, it's supposed to, to be a 2D stuff. Okay, yeah. because I just want yeah. to understand why, why it is that in, when we do this reasoning about holography and asymptotic symmetries and the dual theory, in, in three-dimensional gravity, then we end up with a one plus one theory. Yeah, it is a ADS. Yeah, in ADS CFT, you always decrease by one. The reason why here we decrease by two, if you want, is, um, well, it's just because this, um, you have this very explicit and very natural uh, uh, transformation on the, on the celestial sphere. You know, if you, but yeah, that's, that's, that's what has motivated and you can really make a neat recasting um, on, the, on the two sphere. But again, doesn't mean that, you know, maybe there is another way of formulating, a, I mean, a flat space holography, just, no. Okay, thanks. So are there more questions? Comments? Okay, if not, then we can thank uh, Laura again. Thank so, you. Yes, Laura. Thanks. Let's stop the recording.